the physiology of obesity mechanisms to medicine series started a few years ago when myself and co-organizer dr joe lewis of the university of cambridge felt there was scope to develop an ecr focused symposia which could give more speaking opportunities to ecrs and bring those of us in the obesity and metabolic disease field together to network and disseminate results after three successful symposia at the european congress on obesity experimental biology and the day of physiology 19 We've been delighted to bring this into a webinar series to give fellow ECRs the opportunity to present, network, and network during a time when conferences are being cancelled and opportunities to do so are minimal. With over 1,800 registrations across over 40 countries and another 2,000 views on YouTube, it's great to see so many of you here as we begin the Cardiometabolic Dysfunction and Obesity webinar. Now, for this half of the series, Joe and I have chaired alternate sessions with an invited ECR co-chair each week. Today, I'd like to welcome co-chair Dr. Kirsty Roberts, who completed her PhD at Liverpool John Moores University, where she studied the role of flavonoids in cerebrovascular function. And she's now due to start a postdoc investigating the me mechanisms behind men menopausal hot flushes. So now I'll hand over to Kirsty for some housekeeping and to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Peter. Before I introduce the speakers for today, there are a few housekeeping rules to go over. Our speakers will each deliver a 20 minute presentation and we will then have 15 minutes for a Q&A. Please submit any questions that you may have through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and questions will be directed to the speakers during the Q&A portion of the webinar. But please do submit questions at any time as we will look through these during the presentations. You have the option to submit questions anonymously if you would like to do so. If not, please include your institution at the beginning of the, your question so we can announce this with your name. We might not have time for all questions, but we will try and get through as many as possible. You can also upvote questions and also type your own answers or comments to other attendees' questions. And finally, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available to re-watch. So our first speaker for today is Diana Santos. In 2018, Diana completed her master's degree in cellular and molecular biology with a thesis titled Epicardial Adipose Tissue Biology at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. In 2019, she was awarded a PhD fellowship from the Foundation for Science and Technology with her PhD focusing on epicardial adipose tissue microRNAs. So thank you very much, Diana. So good afternoon. Can you see it? Um... The presentation. Okay. So as uh, Christy was saying, my name is Jana Sanch. I am a PhD student at the Center for Neuroscience and Cell Biology at the University of Coimbra, Portugal. Today I will talk a little bit about the impact of the epicardial adipose tissue in the development of cardiac disease. Uh, I start my bachelor's uh, in biology in 2012 in the University of Aveiro in Portugal. And in the last year, I moved to Santiago de Compostela, where I start my uh, first um, research in the diabetes and obesity, uh, where we uh, focus in the uh, role of the kinase MST3 in the diabetic um, hepatic glucose uh, absorption. Then I came back to Portugal for my uh, master in cellular and molecular biology that I finished in 2018. And now I'm doing my uh, second year of PhD. And this PhD will be in collaboration with uh, the Roskilde University and uh, also with the University of Leeds. So as you know, cardiac diseases represent the leading cause of death in the world. It represents more than 30% of the old deaths. Uh, it also represents high uh, costs, uh, economic costs. And when we are talking about diabetes, we have an increase, patients, we have an increase to two to three times the risk to develop cardiovascular diseases. But which are the risk factors to develop these diseases? We have the sex, age, genetic heritage, also the infections and smoking and drinking habits. But one of the most um, risk factors are the unhealthy habits, which includes the diet, but also the sedentarism. But how do they influence the cardiac diseases progression? If you have a diet that is increased in blood 
uh, in sugar levels, we will increase the blood sugar levels uh, that may lead to insulin resistance and um, to uh, other metabolic disorders, including diabetes. If you have a diet that is increased, uh, it has higher levels of fat, we will increase the triglycerides level and also the cholesterol levels, uh, which leads to dyslipidemia. Then uh, if you have a salty diet, we, it will increase our blood pressure. And this um, represents the force that the blood needs to do to go through the arteries. And when this um, tension is too high, we, it will damage the uh, artery walls. And when they will uh, be repaired, we will lose some of the elasticity. Uh, and then the obesity, as it will uh, also um, as be a consequence of the all other risk factors and is one of the most uh, risk factors associated to the cardiac disease development. But how did these um, factors uh, affect uh, the arteries? Um, we have an uh, increase of the plagues that are deposited in the arteries and the arteries become plugged. So we have a restricted blood flow. And sometimes this blood flow can also be blocked and uh, it happens um, a stroke or a myocardial infarctation. But uh, it also can lead to the increment of the body fat deposits, uh, including the body fat, the deposits that are in the heart. So there are several uh, fat deposits in the heart, but one that we are taught today is epicardial adipose tissue. It's a white adipose tissue, but it's a, a, a specific type of visceral adipose tissue, and it is more than a fat deposit. It also secretes several adipokines and hormones that are related with uh, thermogenic functions and um, the regulation of several aspects in the cardiac homeostasis. It has uh, embryonic origin from the brown adipose tissue, and it uh, says that he has a specific transcriptome with a high uh, content in mitochondria, and this way it's related with the thermogenic functions and also with the support uh, to the high uh, demands of energy, uh, energy in the myocardium. Uh, this tissue is also important because it has a close anatomical affinity with the cardiomyocytes because there is no fascia layer between the adipocytes and the cardiomyocytes and also because it is uh, vascularized directly by branches of the coronary arteries. So they, say they share the same uh, microcirculation. Uh, so we can say that there is a direct diffusion on the adipose tissue contents into the coronary arteries and myocardium. In the last years, we have already studied and focused in different topics about to understand the epicardial um, adipose biology, uh, um, mainly the glucose uptake, lipid metabolism, also the proteostasis, uh, oxidative, oxidative stress, and also mitochondrial respiration. Uh, how do we do that? We collect samples from patients that are undergoing cardiothoracic surgery at the Centro Hospitalario Universitario de Coimbra. Uh, our donor patients were both uh, male and female, with and without diabetes, and also lean and obese. For each of them, we collect uh, subcutaneous and epicardial adipose tissue, and also blood samples. We know that the adipocyte size is being related with the aspects in the lipid metabolism and also in the glucose uptake and lipolysis and lipid storage. So that was the first thing that we looked at for. Uh, we found that the, the epicardial lipose tissue has, are smaller and they are uh, in higher content in the same amount of fat. So this uh, wanted to look for the lipid storage genes, and we found that there is a decrease in several of the uh, lipid uh, storage genes that are expressed in the epicardial adipose tissue. Then we wanted also to look for the lipolysis, and we found that there is a decrease in the lipolysis in the epicardial adipose tissue when compared with subcutaneous, and it also affects the expression 
of several uh, genes that are related also with the lipolysis. So we have a decrease of the lipolysis that the, when it is uh, stimulated by isoproteinol in the picardial adipose tissue. Then we also look for the glucose uptake and has in accordance with the, 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 all the, the metabolism uh, factors that we see before. Also the, the glucose uptake was decreased in the picardial adipose uh, adipocytes when compared with the subcutaneous. So as bullet points, you can say that we have a decrease in the gene expression of the uh, related um, genes related with lipid metabolism and also with the lipolysis. And this may indicate a, a protective mechanism against the lipotoxicity. And we also have a decrease in the glucose uptake. And this uh, could be related with the insulin resistance that is observed in the patients with cardiovascular disease. One of the other uh, research topics that we had was the proteostasis. And proteostasis represents a network that regulates the biogenesis, the folding, the traffic of the proteins. And this is mediated through the unfolded protein response. And uh, when we have the uh, signaling of the uh, stress markers of the endoplasmatic reticulum, there are several pathways that uh, can lead to degrade or to repair these proteins that are unfold or misfold. And this, this is important to understand the evaluate the proteostasis because the adequate protein turnover is essential for the cardiac homeostasis. So uh, in the first place, we will look, we will look for several endoplasmatic reticulum stress markers, and all of them are increased in the cardiology adipose tissue when compared with subcutaneous. And uh, but we still, without knowing which are the pathway that are uh, related with this uh, unfold protein response, it could be through mediated through apoptosis to the uh, endoplasmatic reticulum, reticulum associated degradation or through autophagy. At first uh, step, we look at for the endoplasmatic reticulum apoptosis, associated apop uh, related apoptosis, and we look for the expression of the gene uh, CAD153 or SHOP, and it was increased. Although when we look for the downstream effector, the relation between the, the BIM and BCL2, we, we still have an increase in the epicardial adipose tissue, although it's not significant. Uh, other um, of the pathways that can also lead to apoptosis is through the increase of the IR1-alpha and then through the uh, caspase um, apoptotic pathway. And despite we have an increase in both of the IR1-alpha and also the ratio caspase 4 pro caspase 4 uh, when we look for the general expression of the proteins, we cannot say that this is the, the pathway that is related with the endoplasmatic reticulum apoptosis. So then we looked for the associated degradation, the ERA, and this is related with the um, levels of the ubiquitin and also the proteins that are um, signaled by the ubiquitin, the ubiquitin proteins. And uh, we have a decreased expression either uh, levels of the ubiquitin and also the ubiquitinated proteins. So it seems that what we have now uh, in this tissue is sufficient to degrade the unfolded and misfolded proteins. So the last um, way to, to promote the, the degradation of the misfolded and unfolded proteins is the autophagy. And for that, we need to have an increase in the, and the, an activation in the AMPK. And this happens. We have an increase of AMPK um, activation and also uh, the inhibition of the mTOR pathway. And this is exactly what happens in the epicardial adipose tissue. So we can say, uh, we can, it can suggest that we have an autophagy activation in this tissue. Then we look for the downstreams and for the proteins that are markers, uh, membrane are markers for the autophagosome. And we can see that we have an increase 
in the backlink one, either uh, gene expression and protein levels, and we have also an increase in the LC3, 2, and 1. Then we looked also for the, the expression of the lysosomes um, membrane markers. We also see a, an increase of the LAM2 uh, mRNA uh, gene expression of the LAM2. So for the proteostasis, we can say that we have an increase of the endoplasmatic reticulum stress markers in this tissue that can be uh, also related with the increase of the autophagic markers. And then it can uh, be related with the protective or survival function uh, of this tissue uh, to promote uh, the best cardiac homeostasis. Uh, then our focus was the oxidative stress because we know that it is related with the pathogenicity of the cardiac diseases. And despite we have a decrease in MDA levels that are the result of the lipid peroxidation, we also have a decrease uh, activity of the uh, KIPX in the epicardial adipose tissue. So it tends to accumulate the, the GSA and then uh, this leads to an increased expression of the stress markers. And we also look for the antioxidant defense and they are uh, compromised in the epicardial adipose tissue, which potentiates, and this is the, our um, bullet point for oxidative stress. We have an increase of um, oxidative stress markers and decrease in the antioxidant defenses. Then we know that uh, the mitochondria are um, that the epicardial adipose tissue can be a high energetically um, tissue, and this can be related with the mitochondrial respiration. And we also know that this is, uh, it has beige adipose size, so it should have uh, proteins that are related with brown adipose tissue. So we look for the UCP1, and we have an increase of the gene expression of the UCP1. And UCP1 is related with the uncoupled respiration. But if we block UCP1 with the GDP, we will promote the normal coupled respiration. What we did was to look for two different protocols, the uh, NDH linked uh, contribution for the oxidative phosphorylation and later for the fatty acid uh, contribution in the oxidative phosphorylation. So what we saw was an increased mitochondrial respiration in the epicardial when compared with the subcutaneous, but when we inhibit the UCP1, uh, we still have an increase in mitochondrial respiration, although this is a decrease uh, when compared with when we have the UCP1 uh, active. When we look for the fatty acid uh, contribution in the ox oxidative phosphorylation, we still have an increase of the um, mitochondrial respiration in the epicardial adipose tissue. And when we inhibit uh, UCP1 with GDP, we are increasing the mitochondrial respiration in the epicardial adipose tissue when compared with subcutaneous. And this uh, may be uh, said to us that UCP1 is, could be relevant in the fatty acid oxidation uh, and in the mitochondrial activity in the epicardial adipose tissue. So as bullet points, we know that we have either an increase in the NDH linked ox uh, oxidative phosphorylation and in the fatty acid oxidation contribution, and also that somehow UCP1 can play a role in the physiology of the epicardial adipose tissue. Um, our next studies, and we are what we are uh, focusing now, is to understand the microRNA and also which are the immune cell populations in this uh, epicardial adipose tissue. Um, as general conclusion, uh, we hope that the characterization of this tissue, uh, in terms of glucose uptake, lipid metabolism, proteostasis, oxidative stress, and mitochondrial respiration, and also this uh, new to uh, focus uh, may contribute for the discovery of specific biomarkers and therapies to improve the health condition of the cardiac disease patients. At the end, I would like to acknowledge all the members of the obesity, diabetes, and complications group that are involved in this work. 
to the cardiothoracic surgery from the Centro Hospitalar de Coimbra uh, and also to the uh, funding, to our funding. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, our second speaker today is Satish Bapu Samati, who's a research scientist in the fields of macrophage and vascular biology. In 2009, he joined the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology to study the mechanisms involved during monocyte to macrophage differentiation in the context of vascular complications such as atherosclerosis and aneurysms. And after being awarded his PhD in biochemistry in 2015, he then joined Dr. Partha Dutta's lab in the Vascular Medicine Institute at the University of Pittsburgh in 2016. Here he investigated the role of immune cells, particularly macrophages in the disease pathogenesis, including heart failure, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and insulin resistance. So thank you, Satish. If you could share your screen, please. Oh, it's, it is visible and audible now, right? Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Satish Babu Vasan Sethi, uh, postdoctoral associate from University of Pittsburgh. Today, I'm going to talk how the apoptosis of hematopoietic progenitor derived adipose tissue resistant macrophages contributes to the insulin resistance, particularly uh, in the context of remote organ injuries like myocardial infarction. <clears throat> About my research background, uh, <clears throat> I carried out my PhD, uh, my, my graduation studies uh, from during 2009 to 2015 in IACT Hyderabad. Um, so my PhD topic was investigating the mechanisms that are related to monocyte macrophage differentiation uh, in the context of atherosclerosis. <clears throat> And after that, I joined in uh, University of Pittsburgh uh, in Dr. Partha Dutta's group. Here, I have been working uh, in studying the role of uh, immune cells, uh, particularly macrophages, uh, in the context of cardiovascular as well as in metabolic disorders like uh, diabetes, insulin resistance, etc. <clears throat> it's well known about the macrophages. Here, actually, in the present, uh, <clears throat> Talk, I wanted to uh, explain um, about the macrophages based on their origin and also about their types. Based on the origin, macrophages are broadly classified into two types. One is a blood monocyte derived macrophages, which leads to the, which plays a major role in inflammation, phagocytosis, and also in the replenishing of the tissue resistant macrophage pools whenever it's required. On the other hand, tissue resistant macrophages, uh, so examples for the tissue resistant macrophages is example uh, is microglia in the case of the brain, cuffer cells in the context of the liver, alveolar macrophages in the context of uh, uh, um, lungs and the intestinal macrophages. They have a specific role like uh, supporting the neurons and visibility and activity in the context of the CNS, central nervous system, and pathogen clearance and also in the promoting of the hepatocytic metabolism in the context of uh, cuffer cells pathogens clearance, resolution of inflammation um, <clears throat> in, uh, in the context of alveolar macrophages and intestinal macrophages. So where the macrophages, they interact with the microbiome and maintains the in the immunity. And also they have a major role in the maintenance of the tissue homeostasis, angiogenesis, and also in the wound healing. <clears throat> and again, based on the origin and the timeline, uh, so macrophages are, uh, they derive from either, uh, they're either embryo derived um, or adult origin derived. In embryo, yolk sac and fetal liver are the major time points. Yolk sac, here, <coughs> yolk sac that time E8.5, that is the embryonic uh, day 8.5 is the timeline from where the macrophages, uh, from where the yolk sac is the major source. And... <coughs> Yolk sac, it, it gives rise to the uh, resident macrophages like microglia. On the other hand, fetal liver, uh, the timeline E12.5, embryonic day 12.5. That is embryonic day means is a time um, from the, is a time of, uh, is a time where, um, from when uh, the, is the time uh, when the actual mating happened. Uh, so that day is considered as E, E0. E 
and e 12.5 is 12.5 days after the mating and fetal liver it gives rise to the uh, cells uh, macrophages like langerhans kaffer cells kaffer cells heart lung kidney uh, associated macrophages <clears throat> these macrophages throughout the life they self renew so they proliferate on their own but on the other hand adult during adult stage bone marrow is a major source uh, for the hematopoietic stem cells hematopoietic stem cells are basically hematopoietic stem cells means uh, which gives rise to the uh, all the types of um, blood cells so these hematopoietic stem cells they give rise to the bone to the Mm. <clears throat> it gives rise to the uh, <clears throat> monocytes black monocytes these black monocytes um, in response to the particular injury or infection um, infection um, they form they, de they 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 develop into the black monocyte derived macrophages these actually these black monocyte derived macrophages uh, they don't proliferate so they have to depend on the uh, hematopoietic stem cells for whenever there is uh, there is a requirement <clears throat> so based on this thing here actually we are interested uh, in the vessel adipose tissue uh, here we wanted to identify what are the various macrophage subsets that are present in the vessel adipose tissue that is a mesenteric adipose tissue and what is their origin and also we wanted to investigate the changes in the vessel adipose tissue macrophage subsets after a distant organ injury like a uh, myocardial infarction that is a, a heart uh, heart uh, heart attacks and finally we wanted to examine the effect of how the changes uh, in the in this vessel adipose tissue macrophage subset population it leads to the metabolic complications like insulin resistance <clears throat> so first to identify what are the different macrophage subsets that are present in the vessel adipose tissue we wanted to study the these different macrophage subsets based on the expression levels of two chemokine receptors one is cx3 cr1 and the other one is ccr2 cx3 cr1 is a, a cx3 c, c chemokine receptor and the other one is ccr2 chemokine receptor 2 these two receptors they play a major role in the adhesion and the migration of the leukocytes to investigate the different sets of macrophages in the vessel adipose tissue based on these two receptors we we selected cx3 cr1 gfp reporter mice here all the cx3 cr1 expressing cells they express gfp in this mice and then we collected the wet and we analyzed the expression levels of macrophages based on the expression levels of these two receptors in the vessel adipose tissue and we found two different set, uh, macrophage subsets one is a cx3 cr1 positive ccr2 positive these are actually cx3 cr1 high expressing ccr2 high expressing macrophages and the other one is cx3 cr1 low cx3 cr1 ccr2 low that is cx3 cr1 negative ccr2 negative macrophages so from this my segment we found we identified two macrophage subsets one is double positive macrophage subsets and the other one is the uh, double negative macrophage subsets next to identify the origin of these two macrophage subsets we performed parabiosis experiment parabiosis means it is a surgical joining of two different mice here we used one mice is cx3 cr1 gfp reporter mice and the other one is wild type mice but these two mice are they are different in their cd45 point in the cd45 leukocyte uh, antigen so this cd45 is uh, it exists in either 45.1 or in 45.2 which helps in the study of the origin of um, <clears throat> of myeloid cells then we perform and <clears throat> we perform the parabiosis experiment and we analyzed we extracted the vat in the cd45.1 mice after four months of parabiosis when we analyzed the uh the expression levels of cx3 cr1 positive and ccr2 on uh, um, cx3 cr1 negative ccr2 negative macrophages which are cd45.2 parabine derived 
then we identified that in cd 45.1 all the cx3 cr1 positive cc uh, cc r2 positive macrophages they are mostly uh, they are para they are cd 45.2 derived on the other hand these double negative macrophages they are not derived from the uh, cd 45.2 that seems that means the <clears throat> double negative macrophages that are present in the cd 45.1 they are not derived from the parabine derived that means they are tissue resident macrophages on the other hand double positive macrophages as they derived from the cd 45.2 they are blood monocyte derived macrophages with these things we confirmed that there are uh, <clears throat> we confirmed the existence of double positive and double negative to macrophages and also we identified that double positive macrophages are actually blood monocyte derived whereas the whereas on the other hand the double negative macrophages are tissue resident <clears throat> next we wanted to identify the the timeline of this uh, tissue resident macrophages we for this we used the uh, the following mice that is csf1 nor mer creamer td tomato mice this is a uh pup that we got by breeding male csf1 or mercrimer with the td tomato uh, mice so i i forgot to mention about the csf1 or um, csf1 or is the uh, colony stimulating factor uh, receptor um, <clears throat> this is usually this is expressed from the day from the uh, from the embryo from the embryo site from the embryo sac time period that means <clears throat> embryo sac time period so <clears throat> so it is the marker for the for studying the embryo sac and the uh, embryo sac and uh, liver uh, time period generated uh, macrophages when we so into this mice we injected tamoxifen at week 4 and we extracted the vat at week 16 and we when we analyzed the uh macrophages for the td tomato expression we found that most of these vessel adipose tissue macrophages are actually td tomato positive suggesting that these tissue resistant macrophages are self uh are self replicating they uh, they they maintain their uh by their self renewal on the other hand microglia it is the positive control yes i already mentioned that uh, csf1 or Uh, is a early marker for the for studying the uh, embryo sac and the um, liver um, <coughs> uh, liver derived macrophages next we investigated whether these macrophages are either um, <coughs> embryo sac or the uh, liver derived uh, liver, uh, liver derived macrophages for that we injected tamoxifen into the female rosa td tomato cream my tomato mice that was mated with csf1 or cream csf1 or mercrimer when we injected tamoxifen either on e8 e8.5 or e8 e8 13.5 and we extracted the pups at the deep at the day p0 p0 means that day, the time of birth the day of birth post birth <clears throat> the time of birth so when we analyzed the expression levels of td tomato in the vessel adipose tissue macrophages in these pups we identified uh, there is of not much expression suggesting that these tissue resistant macrophages are not either uh, either embryo sac or liver derived next we <clears throat> injected the tamoxifen into the csf1 or mercrimer td tomato pups on p0 and we extracted the vat on p14 and p28 and we found that Uh, on p14 and p28 these macrophages are 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 td tomato so that says that the macrophages that are present at that day p0 uh, they are giving rise to the proliferation of this tissue resistant macrophages yes p0 it is the timeline for the hematopoietic stem cells the the origin of these hematopoietic stem cells we used the another mice that is the flt3 cree flt3 cree it is called as fms like a tyrosine kinase 3 which is important for the normal development of the hematopoietic stem cells and the progenitors so this is the best marker to study the origin of the tissue origin of the hematopoietic stem cells and we found that uh, in these pups at the day p28 most of the vat resident macrophages are actually 
uh, TD tomato, suggesting that the hematopoietic stem cells that are present at the P0 is giving rise to these tissue resistant macrophages. On the other hand, microglia, which is known to develop from the day 8.5, here uh, it is negative. So, suggesting that uh, is our uh, control basically. Yes, we identified the, these two different macrophage subsets. Next, we wanted to uh, compare. Uh, next, we compared um, <clears throat> these two different macrophage subsets along with the monocytes. And we found that these double positive macrophages, which are represented in red, they are in close resemblance to the monocytes. On the other hand, tissue resistant macrophages, which are in, in the middle, they are bigger in size, having the uh, <clears throat> Having the uh, having <clears throat> having the more uh, vacuole size, they are completely different from the uh, from monocytes and double positive macrophages, suggesting that they are different in their characteristics compared to the other two. Next, we perform the RNA sequencing analysis in these three macrophage populations. Uh, <clears throat> monocytes double positive on the double negative macrophages uh, so and we found that uh, <clears throat> the double negative macrophages they are they have the distinct they have the different transcriptomic profile compared to the other two and also we found that these double negative macrophages they are expressing the higher levels of lipid metabolism and insulin sensitivity regulating genes like foxo1 foxo3 etc and also we identified the higher expression levels of gata6 which is known to um, which is a transcription factor that is known for maintaining the insulin sensitivity so with these things it seems the double positive macrophages which are monocyte derived macrophages and monocytes they have the uh, they have the close uh, transcript transcriptomic profile whereas the double negative macrophages they are they, they are different and also we found that the <coughs> the double positive macrophages <coughs> the first one the second one is the uh, <coughs> And we found that these double positive macrophages, they are having the higher expression levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukin, interleukin beta, interleukin 6, and also the higher expression levels of chemokines like CCL2, CCL3, CCL4, CCL5, etc. On the other hand, the double negative macrophages, they are having higher expression, level, expression levels of uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-4, which is also important for the uh, maintaining of the insulin sensitivity. So with these things, it is clear that the double uh, the double positive macrophages, they are, are pro-inflammatory in nature, whereas the double negative macrophages are anti-inflammatory in nature. Uh, I'll be first. <laughs> Next, <clears throat> we wanted to investigate how this tissue resistant, uh, we wanted to investigate how uh, the distant organ injury like a myocardial infarction, it affects uh, this tissue on um, um, this tissue resistant macrophages. Uh, so, so far it is well known that insulin resistance is, is causes the um, for, um, insulin resistance causes the myocardial infarction. But so far there are no uh, concrete studies suggesting is insulin resistance is responsible for the myocardial infarction. So to in investigate this, we uh, we we turned into the um, sweetheart register data so in collaboration with the university of land so where uh, the 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 blood glycosylated hemoglobin levels are available for the STEMI patients here um, the 4500 is the number of this 4500 24% of the patients are the are the diabetic whereas the other 76% are non diabetic patients these we consider these patients are non diabetic based on the uh, serum glycosylated hemoglobin levels the patients who are having less than um, 6.5 glycosylated hemoglobin levels are considered as the uh, as a non diabetic next to investigate further we turned into the upmc cath uh, upmc national cardiovascular data registry where uh, <clears throat> where um, blood fasting blood glucose levels is available for the patients so 14000 is the initial cohort of this 1900 patients are the semi patients of this there are only 341 patients who are non diabetic and the other and from this there are only 27 patients who are not, not who are not a non diabetic patients 
so here for these patients fasting blood glucose levels is available just before the 15 days of myocardial infarction and also after the 30 days of the myocardial infarction <clears throat> And of these 27 patients, when we compare their blood glucose levels, we found that these patients are having the higher uh, blood glucose levels after MA, suggesting the features of insulin resistance. Next, we <coughs> used the mice models uh, to investigate further. For this, we uh, we performed the uh, we performed the coronary artery ligation to induce the myocardial infarction, and we. Uh, performed the glucose intolerance, glucose tolerance test in sham and MI mice, and we found that the mice that had MI, they are highly glucose intolerant, and also they have the higher levels of serum insulin, and also they are uh, they are having the uh, less uh, um, uh, they are having the impaired phospho AKT status, suggesting that the mice that have MI are high are glucose intolerant. Next, we investigated the effect of myocardial infarction on this tissue region macrophages. For that, we analyzed the CCR2 negative macrophage population in the in the diabetic uh, in the uh, in the myocardial infarction patients and in control patients, and we found that uh, the CCR2 negative macrophages they are highly lesser in the visceral adipose tissue of the mice. Similar results we found even in the mice, the mice that are having uh, MI are having the lesser levels of tissue region macrophages, suggesting that visceral adipose tissue it declines the <coughs> tissue visceral adipose tissue region macrophages decline after mi next from our rna sequencing analysis we found that this is rna sequencing analysis in the visceral adipose tissue region macrophages that are isolated from the sham and mi group and we found that the mice the visceral adipose tissue macrophage resident macrophages that are isolated from the MI group, they are having the higher expression levels of uh, ne necrosis and apoptotic pathways. These are confirmed with our uh, tunnel staining showing that the visual adipose tissue macrophages of, of MI, they are highly apoptotic. <clears throat> and also we, next we confirmed the uh, importance of the tissue resident macrophages on insulin sensitivity uh, here we used the the following mice model that is a channel rhodopsin mice here the channel rhodopsin flox flox mice is uh, uh, here the cells that express uh, channel rhodopsin upon exposure to the blue light uh, they undergo apoptotic so here we used the lysosome memory uh, channel rhodopsin mice so that means here the macrophages the myeloid cells specifically express the uh, channel rhodopsin mice. The other one is the flox flox mice, uh, that is a wild type mice. And this is our experimental approach. Uh, we uh, <clears throat> we exposed the visceral adipose tissue of these mice to the blue light, and uh, one day after the blue light exposure, we performed the MI and uh, we conducted the GTD after on day eight, and we found that the mice that are expressing. Um, <clears throat> Uh, channel rhodopsin in their macrophages when exposed to the blue, blue light they are having the lesser levels of tissue resistant macrophages next we performed the glucose tolerance test and we found that the mice uh, <clears throat> that are specifically expressing channel rhodopsin upon exposure to the blue light they are having the more glucose intolerant and also the more uh, serum insulin levels and also we found that to uh, DAMS. DAMS means uh, <clears throat> disease associated molecular patterns like hemo, uh, HMGB1, uh, homeo, <clears throat> which are released after the MI. They are known to induce the, uh, they are known to, uh, uh, <clears throat> they are known to secrete after the MI. So here we found that the HMGBs, they have a higher effect on the, um, on the survival of the of the macrophages, suggesting that dams that are released after the MI, they are actually influencing the, um, <clears throat> actually influencing the survivability of the of this tissue resistant macrophages. Next, from our <clears throat> QVCR analysis, we found that uh, these are double negative macrophages. They are having they are expressing higher levels of macrophage colony stimulating factor receptor which is known for the maintenance and the survival of the tissue resistant macrophages and also we found that the mice that are having mi they are having the lesser levels of mcp mcf in their uh, visual adipose tissue suggesting the importance of mcsf signaling in the in the survivability of this tissue resistant macrophages Next, we used the following mice model that is a CSF honor flox flox and the, that is lysosome mcre. That means uh, CSF honor is specifically depleted in the macrophages. And we found that the mice that are specifically depleted 
csf one are they are highly glucose intolerant with more area uh, with more area under curve and more insulin resistance and also they are having the less tissue resistant macrophages in the in the in another approach we injected either pbs or uh, mcsf1 into the vessel adipose tissue of mi induced mice and we found that uh, the mice that are injected with colony stimulating factor is improved glucose sensitivity suggesting the importance of confirming the importance of mcsf signaling in the survivability of the tissue resistant macrophages and also in the uh, maintenance of the insulin sensitivity <clears throat> and also we found that the macrophages that are isolated from the mcsf injected group they are more uh, anti inflammatory <clears throat> and it's known that adiponectin which is a adipokine that is known to play a major role in the maintaining of the insulin sensitivity and we found that the patients the the mice that are having the mi they are having the lesser levels of adiponectin and the mice that was injected with mcsf it, uh, it, it has improved adiponectin so suggesting the importance of the adiponectin um, in mi <clears throat> then we used the adiponectin knockout mice and when we um, when we um, <clears throat> induced mi in a wild type and adiponectin mice we found that adiponectin mice are more glucose intolerant so with these things we conclude that um, during mi so hngb1 so damps that are released from the heart they affect the survivability of the tissue resistant macrophages by influencing the colony stimulating factor signaling this tissue resistant macrophages in turn maintain the insulin ses- sensitivity through adipokines like adiponectin uh, finally i would like to thank everyone thank you thank you thank you for that satish and thank you diana two great talks there um so we'll just move on now to the questions to the q and a and i think so there are a couple i think that were answered so i'll just i'll just go over them for the benefit of anyone who missed them uh, so kenneth the bobin said to diana nice overview of your work uh, as a comparator to epicardial fat to use subcutaneous um is this abdominal gluteal or another subcutaneous adipose tissue um, and other differences in adipocyte properties etc um diana uh, our um type of uh, white adipose tissue the subcutaneous adipose tissue that we are using is the in the sternum region and it's collected at the same time that we are collecting the the epicardial adipose tissue biopsies so at least in terms of the duration of the collection it will be the same which is my representative for us great thank you and um and then the second follow up question from Kenneth Bobin said based on your findings would you describe epicardial fat as white or brown and are these findings specific for cardiovascular disease patients or do they corroborate results in other populations So has it has an embryonic origin from the brown adipose tissue we can say that it has um that it, it express markers from the brown adipose tissue including uh, UCP1 but also other uh, brown adipose tissue markers uh, but it also uh, behaviors has a white adipose tissue and with uh, is related mm-hmm. with the secretion of several bite of molecules and but it's most uh, brown adipose tissue Uh, at this point we can only uh, compare this um the cardiovascular disease um population because it's the only way that we can get these um, samples um so at least uh, it is valid for uh, the this uh, population thank you um, diad i had a question so i wondered if you know or have any thoughts on um on how these proteasomal enzymes and how these apoptotic factors in the epicardial fat like how they how they act on the myocardium because there's obviously a lot of, a lot of discussion about this crosstalk um but i guess we're quite limited in how we can actually study that crosstalk yeah this is what we want to do now we want we are trying to collect also some um parts of the myocardial uh, walls and to try to see uh, how these uh, alterations that we see and that we have already found in the epicardial adipose tissue can be also related with what we are seeing in the myocardial but for now we don't know how okay great thank you and then um just another one there's some data there's some data out there showing that epicardial 
that characteristics differ based on where you sample from. So sort of different parts of different parts of the depot around the coronary arteries. Yes. Um, so how does your data compare across the depot? Have you compared that in, in your group? Uh, yes, we have, uh, well, when we ask for the, the sample collection, we when we talk with surgeons, we ask to collect always in the same position to guarantee that we are looking for, uh, always for the same tissue. Because we know that, the, for example, the perivascular tissue has completely different um, characteristics than the epicardial. Um, and sometimes when we are looking to the results, um, we we need to make sure that it's uh, the same tissue that we are uh, seeing. Great, great. And then there was another, um, there was a couple of questions from Dan Brayson and um, Fatima de Heredia from Liverpool John Moores. And so Dan was asking, do you know why the thoracic surgeries, cardiothoracic surgeries are being performed? Did any of the patients have coronary artery disease? And what was the difference between patients and controls? And then from Fatima, she was talking about did the she may have missed it, but did the tissue donors present with overweight, obesity, or diabetes? So I guess a couple of questions on the um, on the makeup of the population. Uh, yeah, we have uh, in the our population study we have both diabetic and non-diabetic population, and also lean and obese at the beginning. And we have also different types of cardiovascular diseases. We have the valvuloplasty, uh, the coronary artery disease, and also the um, some um, uh, from the hypertrophy and some um, congenity. Um, surgeries and we wanted to know in the beginning was to uh, see the difference between the non-diabetic and diabetic population at the first uh, step uh, and then um, also the difference between the coronary artery disease and the ones that are related with the valves. But um, we all always look for the difference between non-diabetic and diabetic patients but in most of these uh, aspects we have no difference between them and um, but to uh, describe between the different types of um, uh, cardiac disease we have a low number to have sufficient data to to have these results great great thanks a lot for that Diana there's um, a couple of questions now for Satish so question from Dan Brayson or a couple of questions um, nice talk macrophages aside did you look for other immune cell populations in myocardial infarction patients? And I'm fascinated to know how you activated the channel rhodopsin in vivo from a logistical perspective. And um, I'd also like to ask whether it was necessary to perform parabiosis experiments. Um, could you not, for example, perform uh, blood transfusions? Thank you. <clears throat> The first one is, uh, did you look for other immune cells? No. So at that time, we are not, uh, we were mostly interested in, uh, uh, about the macrophages. So unfortunately, yeah, we, we couldn't do that. The second one is, uh, uh, yeah, the channel rhodopsin act uh, activation. So here, the channel rhodopsin is a, pro is a protein. So upon exposure to the blue light, uh, uh, it becomes activated and it induces the apoptosis. For that purpose, uh, we... Uh, we took out the um, uh, vessel adipose tissue from the live mice and we exposed it to the blue light uh, for about uh, 10 minutes uh, with uh, intermittent uh, gaps actually. Um, so we did like that. And the final one is uh, uh, parabiosis. So to study the origin, origin of the macrophages. So, so parabiosis is the gold standard. So that with that only we can identify whether the macrophages are either uh, derived from the uh, other mice. So that means either they are the blood monocyte derived or the tissue resident macrophages. <laughs> so with blood transfusion, it's not possible. So parabasis is a uh, is a technique. Yeah, so we need to do that. Great, Sorry. thank you. Um, and I guess back onto the macrophage populations. I, I may have missed it, um, but what are the, you know, What's the abundance of these macrophage populations in human um, visceral fat uh, com yeah, compared to uh, other? Compared to the other, uh, we uh, we didn't 
uh, look into those things. Actually, uh, during this whole study, we were uh, mostly interested about the uh, tissue region macrophages and the macrophage, uh, monocyte derived macrophages. So we try to compare those two, basically. Okay. Okay. And then I think, um, just I think just to finish off, I had you know I think there was a there was a lot of a lot of knockout models and a lot of experiments there. Very you know very comprehensive work. But I think you know going forwards practically and translationally, you know where where do you go from here? What's the you know what's the utility do you see of identifying and phenotyping and finding the importance of these macrophages? Uh, actually, I didn't explain one, uh, one slide. So, so far, it is well known that uh, um, diabetes and insulin resistance, they, uh, they, uh, they are one of the sources for, uh, for the uh, insulin resistance. But so far, actually, um, there are no any concurrent studies. Whether myocardial infarction or the uh, myocardial infarction, it can lead to the insulin resistance. So from our clinical data, we found that even the patients who are not non-diabetic at the time of insulin resistance, they may be prone for the insulin resistance. So that is the one of the novelty of this, uh, of this study. So we found that we identified the importance of the, the chance, the role of the effect of myocardial infarction on the insulin resistance. And um, <clears throat> Uh, from the translational point of view, we need to do conduct some more. We need to extend these studies definitely. Um, maybe the ediponectin, um, as we found the importance of the ediponectin, uh, yeah, it can be um, helpful to continue the translational studies. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, so I, th I think that's it, unless there's no more questions come through. So I think thank you both, Satish and Diana, for you know two great talks. Thank you, Kirsty, for co-chairing today. And I hope you'll all join us next week for our transgenal, transgenerational regulation of behavior and metabolism session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.